Thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be able to have this opportunity to speak at this event. Um, for those of you who uh, don't know anything about the work that I do, um, I should just mention that I'm a philosopher. This is, you know, to give you some realistic expectations about what you're going to hear from me. I'm a philosopher. And um, I work in the area of um, ethical values and how these connect with digital technologies. Um, and it's been my great fascination when I think about the disciplinary gulf that exists between those of us who are looking at ethical um, and legal and societal uh, issues relating to privacy in particular, and those on the other side of the gulf who are, I consider to be the computer scientists, mathematicians, um, and engineers, and by the way, I'm going to use the word technologists to uh, encapsulate all of that. Occasionally, uh, you know, I'm fascinated by what, how that work implicates the kind of work I do, and I'm always looking across this gulf to see if there's some people on that other side who are willing to just build a bridge just a little bit far enough so that I can actually have a conversation with them. And it's really been my enormous pleasure over the years to have these conversations with Cynthia, um, whose work, um, and I don't want to denigrate any of the other work that is very technical, but uh, in particular to call out Cynthia's work that has always been grounded in real problems in the world, and then to say, how can my craft, how can uh, the work, the theories that um, I'm familiar with, help to make progress in, in these um, problems that actually have societal significance. Um, so I've been incredibly fortunate, and as Cynthia says, uh, look back to 2001 and compare notes on uh, what has been going on, and it sounds like a tremendous amount on the front of differential privacy. So how to think about this talk that I'm going to give, and I've been thinking about it for a long time, and working really hard at it, and what I, the way I think of it is as you know how you have a series, Batman and Robin, and there are a whole series of movies or Star Wars, and then they kind of run out of the ideas, they get to the very end, and they say, oh, okay, let's do a prequel. And so I think of this talk as the prequel. The sequels have not yet been done, but I hope that this will be a prequel to some good stuff to, to follow. But when I get to the end, you'll see why it's just really the beginning. So what is the question? that I've been looking at for many years. The question is a conceptual one. I'm a philosopher. And the question is, what do we mean by privacy? And it's not really just an analysis of the concept of privacy, but what I'm interested in, given in light of technology, is when people say, oh, you know, surveillance cameras, my privacy has been violated, or the Snowden um, revelations, and we say, oh, the NSA has violated my privacy, what do they mean? Can we capture in a rigorous way, to the extent possible, what can we capture what it is that people are saying when they're making such remarks? And then the next question is, well, why, why do we even care what it means? And why should we try and address those concerns that privacy has been violated? So it's the conceptual clarification, and then there's also the ethical analysis, which tries to explain why privacy is of value. And that's the work that has engaged me, but it's always in relation to technical advances. Now, my work is not new. So some of you probably know about uh, the groundbreaking paper that was written by Warren and Brandeis, um, The Right to Privacy in 1895. Some of you may not also know that um, Louis Brandeis went on to become a member of the Supreme Court, and in 1928, there was a court case in which um, the, the FBI had um, tapped a phone of Olmsted, uh, who they uh, thought was selling liquor. This was during the Prohibition. Now, the court actually said, they, the, the majority concluded, that, that no um, violation of the Fourth Amendment had occurred, and this was a legal search. But Brandeis wrote a beautiful dissent, and in it, I, I hope you're probably already reading it, he goes, and it feels so modern, right, almost 100 years ago, 
Discovery and invention have made it possible for the government by means of more, ef more effective than s a stretching upon the rack uh, to obtain disclosure in court of what is whispered in the closet. And it says, ways may sometimes be the, someday be developed by which government, without removing papers from secret drawers, can reproduce them in court and by which it will be enabled to expose to a jury the most intimate occurrences at the home. Advances in psychic and related sciences, so that's a little bit off, uh, may bring, so we could delete that part, may bring the means of exploring unexpressed beliefs, thoughts, and emotions. And if you think today about AI and um, machine learning and so forth, I think uh, Brandeis was brilliant in this concern and prediction. And this I just couldn't resist uh, presenting given some of the remarks that have been made today and the significance of differential privacy. You may think, oh, the cat's out of the bad e bag. Everybody knows that uh, de-anonymized data isn't. Um, and this happened, as you can see, September uh, of 2016, and a colleague of uh, from Australia was very concerned about this. I don't expect you to read it, but basically uh, open data is the fashion and government uh, agencies are being are under a lot of pressure to release data. And in Australia, um, wanting to, to uh, be po important part of this uh, 21st century movement have decided to release um, health data uh, with certain fields of information, but they say, don't worry, there is a strict and standard government procedure to de-identify all government data that's published, and it's to be anonymized so that the individuals who are the subject of data cannot be identified. Well, you can imagine this is like a red flag to a bull for certain kinds of computer scientists, and in short order, they were able to re-identify many people in the database. So they go to um, the Attorney General in Australia and they tell them that this can happen. So what does the Attorney General do? Says, hang on, hang on, please don't publish this, don't publish this. And then they say, what we've decided is we're going to create a new criminal offence of re-identifying de-identified government data. So that, and, and this happened in 2000, just a, a month ago, 2016. So there's still a lot of work to be done. Now the presentation for today really is you know, taking us back to, that was really just a little detour, I couldn't resist. So here's the question that I want to ask today. And it's also in light of this, you know, how can people like me um, and people like uh, many of the speakers and people working on the technical side of differential privacy, how can we talk to each other? How can we amplify what each of the others is doing? And so this is the question, in the face of manifold threats, what role does or could differential privacy play in protecting privacy conceived as a societal value worthy of protection? And this is a little, I was, I was, I really like the slide with Latanya Sweeney saying, you know, as uh, Justice Lewis Brandeis had said, technology can be the problem, but technology can also produce the solution. And that's really what has been of great interest to me, and in particular, thinking about, um, for purposes of today, differential privacy and how we um, amplify the work that each of us is doing. Now, I couldn't really think about an entry point uh, to answer this question. And I was reading around and brushing up and doing whatever I could to learn more about differential privacy. And along the way, I, learned, I, I, read, I bumped into various critics of differential privacy. And you know, there are some uh, technical critiques of uh, differential privacy. I, I have no, I, I think that, that uh, differential privacy has been well defended on the technical front. But there were some that came, it seemed to me, from the societal perspective, from the perspective of um, what is the ethical and societal value of privacy and uh, what role can, does or can differential privacy play. And I came upon um, an article that maybe, uh, probably a lot of people who are cr 
cryptographers are aware of. Uh, it made a little bit of a splash last year by Philip Rogaway um, calling on cryptographers to acknowledge the, the political role they can play and should play in society. And it's, as you see, the moral character of crypt cryptographic work. And I came across this, this rather, in a section on differential privacy, it makes this rather surprising claim to me. Uh, is this, this writing is okay, you can read it, right? To me, differential privacy may be as authoritarian in its conceptual underpinnings as IBE, which he had just said was, was authoritarian. Uh, Identity-based encryption. Wow, that seems strange. So what were the reasons for that? I hope you can still read this, but I'll just um, try and capture the essence of it, which is that the model implicitly pays, uh, paints the database owner, the curator, as the good guy and the user's querying at the adversary. But from the history of data privacy breaches, uh, suggests that the principal threat is from the database owner itself and those who gain wholesale access, e.g. by theft or secret government program, uh, programs. So in the end, he's accusing differential privacy of whitewashing uh, the, the, the real privacy problem and making us think that there's some what he calls crypto magic to protect people from data misuse. So that's like one set of problems and I'm labeling that number one and I'm gonna come back to this at the end of the talk and to see, you know, to evaluate um, what the credibility of this claim is. The second one is to, uh, that he says is that um, it presents privacy as conceived entirely in individualistic terms. Privacy is a purely individualistic value when Rogaway is trying to argue that actually it's a, it's a societal value and we have to take public good into consideration. So that, those are two uh, critiques that em emanate from Rogaway and this I'm calling a critique, oh sorry, I, I'm, I'm a little ahead of myself. So uh, reading various articles, uh, here's Cynthia Dwork and Erin Roth who we're gonna hear from they say, we assume the existence of a trusted and trustworthy curator. So you could say that um, it's just out of scope. The critique is out of scope. There's uh, uh, Rogaway saying um, these, these curators, those who actually hold like, the census, say for example, they're the guys who we have to be worried about they're not, they're, there could be the adversary and differential privacy is treating them as a friend and or the trusted party and um, Dwork and Roth are saying, uh, we're assuming that these are trusted curators. So uh, you could just say, oh well, uh, these are out of scope. I want to, um, it is possible to say this is just out of scope, we can assume if we start with the assumption that the holders of the data are um, good guys, are, are, the, are the trusted parties, then we can make Rogaway's critique go away. But I don't want to give up that, that quickly on what Rogaway is concerned about to say, well, you know, what, let, what is it? Is there some nugget of truth? And how do we identify that truth? Uh, that Rogaway is um, presenting to us and where does it, that leave differential privacy. So when I come back to these problem, these questions at the end, hopefully I can shed some light on that. Now the third one is one that I, I want to put out there even though I don't think I fully understand it properly and it really gets to what Cynthia was saying earlier this morning, which is that with the right background information, an attacker can learn about you just from general information about the population, even if you don't submit a survey. So, um, and the case was, uh, you know, if, um, if, you know, if Cynthia is a smoker and, and we've discovered certain things about s smoking from uh, scientific databases, then whether or not Cynthia is in the database, um, she could be harmed um, by, what can be learned from, um, from general scientific research into population uh, data. And 
Uh, this actually came from um, a video of Christine Task, who is definitely not a critic of differential privacy, wildly enthusiastic, but this, this expression of the issue, drawing conclusions about the individual from the aggregate results over the population, um, so researchers still have to be concerned about the kind of research they do. Now this was, uh, I was interested in that because Solon Barokas and I had um, recently published a paper called uh, Big Data's End Run Around Anonymity and Consent. And our argument about um, anonymity and consent was to say that for decades, the way privacy has been protected in the policy arena was either, as you've heard, to anonymize the database, to anonymize data, and then just put it out there and say we've taken care of the privacy concern, or we get people to consent. And I'm sure that all of us have been online and essentially we're consenting to all these privacy policies, and that means that we've um, sort of all bets are off. Once you've consented to certain data flows, then uh, whoever the other party is has already uh, done what they're supposed to do with respect to protecting your data. But what, what a lot of what we argue, and it'll take me too long to go through it, uh, but, but in particular, if you, if you look at the, the final little excerpt from it, uh, what we call tyranny of the, the minority, we're saying um, that if there's some auxiliary information about you that is known, and there's some, let's say, other information about you that is not known, but you can be identified as similar to um, another cluster of people who, uh, who have yielded that information, and the target pregnancy case um, is an instance of that. You may be out there, you, you know, buying the various lotions and vitamins and so on, but you've, you haven't told Target that you're pregnant, but there are other people who have. And so now, um, with as little as 20% of users who are revealing that, uh, Target might say to you, or I remember any time you'll get, say, Verizon says to you, do you um, consent to us using your zip code uh, in order to target you ads, and you may say, you may think that they've given you a lot of power to consent or not consent, but even if you don't consent, as long as there are enough people, and it only takes 20% who do consent, and you can be shown to be similar to those people, then you can be effectively treated in the same way as those who have consented. And so the, there are ways that this general information can impinge upon someone's life. And this is, I think, similar to um, the problem that uh, Task was identifying. So in order to address, and I'm again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, speak some more about conceptions of privacy, and in particular, I'm going to present um, the theory of privacy as contextual integrity, and then I'm going to come back to these questions one, two, and three, uh, and see what we can make of them. So now um, I'm uh, moving on to the next part of the talk, which is a presentation of the theory of privacy as contextual integrity, uh, because I want to put out there certain concepts that are going to be useful for us in addressing these three challenges or these three questions. So. The way, I've, the way I'm going to, in a very brief time, talk about the theory of uh, contextual integrity is to present, kind of reduce it to four essential claims. There are four, I think they're independent theses that you can identify as the theory of contextual integrity. Each one um, offers a, a particular insight into the theory and each one, what, uh, what I'm going to do in the next slides, is to uh, present what the positive claims are of contextual integrity, and then in order to help you see the significance of them, I'm going to present how this particular, any, any one of these four particular aspects of con contextual integrity um, 
makes contextual integrity different from um, some dominant views on privacy that are out there. So the first claim of contextual integrity, the first essential claim of contextual integrity, is that privacy is about appropriate flow of information. So privacy, and I've put differential privacy because I think that might have been the, the, the kind of conversation we were having in 2001. I was trying to guess like what? I didn't remember the details, but it could have been that idea. The idea that there were a lot of people, there were, there were a lot of people out there who had a conception of privacy as, and I think computer scientists and um, many of the Alice and Bob, Alice, Bob, and who are they, Eve, Alice, Bob? Who are the people in the Alice and Bob? What's it there? But then there are all these other characters and they all, <laughs> just Alice, Bob, and Eve, is that all? Oh, anyway, so the idea is, you know, you've got the Alice and Bob and then any information that leaked is a, a, a violation of problem, privacy. And so there is this notion that privacy means secrecy and any release of privacy is a, like versus privacy, is release of information is a violation or a reduction of privacy. And, it's, and you have this concept also among people in the pets community, the privacy enhancing technology community, they're very committed to this notion of data minimization. It, it, it means that you need to uh, perform a certain function, you need to achieve a certain functionality in your system that minimizes the use of data. So there is this idea, and it seemed to me that from an ethical or, or philosophical point of view, this would be a bad thing if privacy was this. Because how can you defend a theory of privacy that it runs so contrary to society? It's not that we have to share information, it's not privacy versus something else that we would all want secrecy and all want not to share, that's ridiculous. We want to share information. Sharing information is how we form relationships. It's, it's productive of so many things of living in society. So it can't be something that we would ask the law to protect if it were secrecy. And so what seemed better is to say that yes, there are certain constraints, let's say privacy um, as a, is appropriate flow. And I think that that's what we have in common with differential privacy, which is to say we want to make, we know a sharing and flow of information is a good thing and we need to do it appropriately. And I think that is a very common thes uh, thesis between, uh, common to contextual integrity and differential privacy. Now, of course, you're all clever people. And you're saying, I'm willing to give you that, but what do you mean by appropriate flow? And then that's the second thesis of contextual integrity. Now, of course, another theory could agree with appropriate flow, but then decide to go in a completely different direction um, from the direction taken by contextual integrity. Now, in order to explain this, I just need to say a little bit about some of the assumption that I'm making about society. I was interested in society not as an undifferentiated social space, but I'm interested in a conception of privacy that's not something I invented, but uh, many social philosophers and social theorists um, adopt this vision or this view and uh, um, political philosophers adopt this view of society, which is, um, it's made up of social context. I use the word context, but usually the other terms that are used, domains, realms, institutions, there's institution theory, Bourdieu, uh, a French philosopher uh, talks about field theory, different fields, different practices. They all share this conception of society as constructed by different domains or contexts. And I adopted um, that understanding of society. And these domains are constructed of various parts. You could think about roles, practices, so you know, and, and, and nothing fancy. I'm talking about healthcare, 
education, family and home life, commerce, just basic things. Sometimes if you look at government, you can see these different uh, contexts reflected in different parts of uh, the way government is, um, is organized. So in addition to these roles and practices uh, and um, activities that uh, identify context, there are norms. So the norms are the expectations of certain kinds of behaviors. We are all, I'm happy to say, acting normatively in this particular environment of the educational context. And I'm sure there are many things that you can do or I can do that would, we would all agree is very, very odd. Um, so there, there are these norms, they're robust norms. Norms are very interesting, they're a whole field of study. And the norms are sometimes just conventional norms, we understand them, they're implicit, they're, uh, they can be explicated, sometimes they're explicated in um, rules of a profession, they could be explicated or embodied in law and a lot of norms, but many norms are not, but some norms are embodied um, in law. And, and the way I use this term, I'm not saying I'm going to define a norm for you. If we were going to understand the type of thing that the norm is, I'm going to say psychologists or anthropologists would go out and study and they would discover what the norms are. Now, um, among the norms, I claim, or this is the claim of the theory, are norms of information flow. They substantive um, regularities or expectations about how information will flow in society, and there can be uh, various different kinds of norms. Now, the main, the main difference between prior or other theories is that some theories, and I talked to you um, about um, consent, informed consent, which uh, is probably dominant in the world today as part of the fair information practice principles. These I would call procedural constraints. And I think about dress code, and you're saying, what should I wear today? You know, so there's a, or, okay, let's make it different. I'm going to a wedding, in, it's a nighttime wedding, dinner and dance, what should I wear? So I'm gonna say, you know, wear evening dress. I'm looking at this crowd, everyone's wearing jeans. So, I don't know, this may not be the best crowd. <laughs> but we could say, you're expected to wear evening wear. Now, that's a substantive constraint. Another kind of constraint is, wear whatever you like. And that's a procedural constraint. And that's what we have at the moment for a lot of privacy protection. But contextual integrity favors a con the, the notion that we actually have substantive norms constraining flow. Um, so, oh gosh, what happened? Something happened. Ah. Sorry, I'm going to have to, I don't know, somehow this, this, this particular slide seems to have gotten out of place. So what do these um, norms look like? I'm not sure what happened over here. Okay, sorry about that. The norm, so again, if you can agree with me that there are substantive informational norms, but uh, we can have differences of opinions about, opinion about what, the, and in fact, uh, some of my colleagues who've been working with me on contextual integrity uh, disagree that these are the exact parameters, but uh, right now this is what the theory of contextual integrity claims. The norms, which are these contextual informational or privacy norms, are re referred to five independent parameters. You have subject, sender, recipient, information type and transmission principle. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time saying more, so if, if it's not clear at the moment, uh, don't worry about it. So the, the, the notion is that if you want to fully describe 
the expectation of information flow for a particular context, so it's relative to a context, then you need to explain the flow or describe the flow in terms of these five parameters, sender, so the actors, sender, receiver, subject, information type or attribute, and transmission principle, which is the constraint or the terms under which information flows. Sorry, now I have to flip back and go to here. So this is just intuitively what uh, if you just spell it out in, English, in the English language, this is what the contextual informational norms could look like. And I point to this one, a citizen of the U.S. is obliged to reveal gross income to the IRS. So, you know, you can yourself start filling in the parameters under conditions of confidentiality except as required by law. So it's kind of complicated, under conditions of uh, confidentiality except as required by law, that's the transmission principle, the attribute uh, sender, receiver, and so forth. So here, just spelling out a little bit more of the, of the five different types, uh, the five parameters, actors, information types, and transmission principles. And as you can see, um, they are, you can, uh, they, they're organized according to context. So uh, when I say physician, that brings to mind the healthcare context and the ontologies of the attributes and the actors um, are identifiable with particular contexts. And um, just as an aside, we're doing a little bit of, uh, um, some, some collaborators and myself are doing a little bit of uh, natural language processing where we're looking at uh, some text to see whether you can train a machine to read natural language text and be able to infer uh, the context in which uh, the, uh, the, that the text is describing. And uh, I can only say they're claiming that they've made a lot of progress and soon hopefully to be published. But anyway, here are the actors, information types, lots of different information types, again, um, relative to the ontologies of particular contexts. The transmission principles are parts that are very dear to my philosopher's heart because uh, although roles and attributes are frequently seen in certain kinds of, uh, you know, uh, formal languages that talk about uh, information transmission and access control in computer science um, and also in policy, this has not been identified or really clearly recognized. So uh, we consent, most people understand. So you can have this information if I consent, but what we don't, what, what is often not recognized is that there are many other kinds of transmission principles. So you can coerce information. Uh, if you're a witness in a court of law, the judge can coerce. And I think that when you're filing your income tax returns, it's not, the IRS saying to you, if you feel like it, or would you please uh, tell us your gross income? No, it's, it's required of you um, to, to give that. Confidentiality is a really important one. Uh, stewardship, and I would argue that if you look at the amendments in the Bill of Rights, uh, many, many times what, what you may not kind of notice is that take the Fifth Amendment, what the Fifth Amendment is saying is that there's information that can be gotten by other means, but you cannot expect the suspect to produce that information and thus incriminate him or herself. So it's not a problem of the, that information being private or sensitive or anything like that. It's a question of how you go about getting that information, and that's what the uh, transmission principle um, represents. So here's this again. You can look at U.S. residents are required by law to file tax returns with a U.S. Uh, internal revenue service. That's the recipient uh, containing information such as name, address, blah, blah, information type uh, under conditions of strict confidentiality. Um, so these describe uh, transmission principle. Now, um, I don't know, I, I should have deleted this file. This, this, this. Uh, so you could imagine that the US 
uh, IRS agrees to supply Donald Trump's tax returns to the New York Times as requested, but um, as we know, there's very strong laws that prohibit uh, that particular transmission of uh, data. Um, these uh, informational norms, some of you may be familiar with this work, have been expressed in formal uh, temporal logic, and some of the work that was done was to, um, so, so the expression of this in formal uh, logic means that you can, um, you could embed these kinds of norms um, in, in, access, in, in ac access control systems, but one of the other things that we did sort of on the other side is to take the structure of the norm and look at actual privacy rules that are associated with the Graham Leach Bliley Act and show that these rules actually, even though they probably whoever the Federal Trade Commission didn't know about contextual integrity, but lo and behold, um, when you ask people to be very precise about information flows, this is the kind of language they produce with all the different um, parameters expressed. So here we are, we're back at this slide, and I just want to round out uh, the, the discussion by pointing out a little bit about, um, about how contextual integrity understood in this way differs from some of the other predominant privacy, views on privacy that are out there, and two in particular that I want to draw your attention to are this idea that, uh, this idea that privacy means the control of information about oneself, which is very strongly embedded I think in many communities, and what I, the way I, uh, the way I present uh, privacy as contextual integrity, I don't, I don't say this is false. I simply say that control is merely one among many possible transmission principles, and if you, what you do when you claim that privacy is control of information about oneself is you've reduced five parameters to one and you simply say control of it. Now the result of this is similar to what I was saying about privacy as secrecy because what happens is that we know that there are countless instances in which we don't hold to the possibility of people controlling information about themselves. And so you'll often hear people talk about, oh, you just have to balance privacy against something else, whatever it is. It could be business efficiency, it could be free speech, it could be security, you name it. So many things that privacy conflicts with. My argument, or they may, people may say, oh, Facebook, obviously people don't care about privacy because they just put it all out there. Contextual integrity says that putting information out is not, does not necessarily have to be contrary to privacy, and same with subject control. There are only certain uh, occasions, and of course you have to uh, ex explicate the various parameters in which individuals do have a right to control information about ourselves, but in many instances, and again, you have to spell out the parameters, you find that the transmission principle is something else. And so this is the way privacy differs from other theories. And I should say that um, we're doing some work that shows that many surveys where people are asked for their opinions or attitudes to information flows, parameters are just left off, and what you find, what we've managed to show, is that in fact there's, in, uh, there's ambiguity, and if you add the parameters back, you get a separation of people's responses to the question. So it's, it's been interesting to see this in practice. So anyway, here's the contextual integrity, let's say prima facie heuristic, which is that if you are given a certain practice, and of course technology is hugely disruptive of information flows, this is why we are doing this work and why it's so fascinating, we have to describe or express the information flow in terms of all the five parameters. 
we look and see whether the flow comports with entrenched contextual informational norms. And if they do, then you say uh, contextual integrity has been preserved. And if, you, if they don't, if you see some kind of violation of something, then you say a case exists for asserting that contextual integrity has been violated. Now, I hope you're thinking at this point, oh my God, this is a terrible theory. Because it means that nothing can ever change. Any change is bad. That's sort of what it looks like. And so in order to um, address that problem, you have to have some kind of ethical theory that says, in some cases, let's take surveillance cameras. Oh, I remember very clearly when we had Google Maps Street View, and you had the defenders of Google Maps Street View saying, but we're just filming public roads. How can that be a problem? When you spell out surveillance cameras using all the different parameters, you see that it's, it's not the same at all. We all know this is not the same at all. The flow, has, the flow structure has changed enormously. For one thing, someone in China can see the front of my house. Or the, so uh, when you, I can see someone when they see me, but a surveillance camera al allows someone else to view me and I don't even know they're looking at me. So it may look like nothing has changed, but when you, when you are forced to spell out the parameters, you see that, that even in simple scenarios like that, a great deal has changed. So now we have to ask the question because I would argue that many of these changes are actually tremendously positive changes because a lot of the developments in the digital technologies have given enormous um, benefit to society. So we need an ability to uh, evaluate the changes or evaluate radically new practices the technology has given us. Um, and that's the part, and that's this part of contextual integrity, which is now the fourth uh, essential claim of contextual integrity. Um, and this is an ethical analysis which says, there, there are three steps that we need to take in order to evaluate the ethical standing of a particular practice and either a changed practice or maybe something that's so radically new uh, we don't even know what to compare it with. We need to evaluate interests and preferences of affected parties. Now, it's, it's really important to say that when you look at a lot of analyses that are out there, that's all they do. They just stop there, and it's, it's not unusual for that because a lot of policy analysis is done precisely in this way. It's kind of cost-benefit analysis. We look at the various stakeholders. We see who wins, who loses. We do some kind of balancing and trading off and so on, but the analysis stops there. A lot of the privacy literature pushes us to number two, which is to say, um, as many of you who've taken any political philosophy, would be very familiar. It's not, uh, it's not just about um, how much cost and benefit or the winners versus the losers, it's about the distribution. So we don't want one person to win almost everything and a hundred people to be the losers. A fair or just society also wants to talk about distribution and there are all sorts of other uh, political values ethical and political values that we want to put in place as um, constraints. And that there's a lot of privacy literature that does this, talks about privacy and ethical and political values. The third part is, is really the key contribution uh, that contextual integrity wants to add, which it says we need to look at, per, you know, per context, the contextual functions, purposes, and values that on top of the first two. And as we see, this really differentiates uh, contextual int integrity from many theories of privacy that are only looking at the benefit of the, the individual data subject. And that allows people to say things that, oh, well, privacy needs to be traded off 
against security, which is a societal value. And the argument of contextual integrity, and here again I put differential privacy, is that privacy is a, is, has societal value. Society, we have a better society if we protect privacy properly. And I think the instinct, as I understand it, be behind differential privacy is that we, we offer differential privacy in order to encourage people to participate in some of these, let's say, research studies and ultimately to yield um, benefit for society. So what are some of these contextual functions, purposes, and values? So in healthcare, you may say cure disease, alleviate suffering. One of the values is equity and, um, I mean, uh, for example, if you take, I don't know, a kidney transplant, uh, who, who does the kidney go to? I don't know, if, you, if you're cynical, you may say it goes to the highest bidder. But the way I understand it, in the medical profession, uh, there's, a, there's probably a complex formula that uh, allocates uh, kidneys to those who need it. Maybe it would be according to medical need. So there are certain values in politics, uh, say democracy, freedom from exploitation, and so on, so forth. So um, when we think about, because we've all just voted, the democratic election, it's secret. Why is it secret? Why do we have secret? But when you think about congressional vote, why is that public? And why is the election secret. So you could say it protects the individual from, say, threat or retribution or, or ridicule. But actually, you have to go one step further. You want to say, why do we want to do that? And the answer is that theoretically, democracy is about autonomous choice of each individual. And if you can't assure that each individual has made an autonomous choice, it's not that they individually stand to lose, it's that democracy will be degraded. And so privacy doesn't just serve the individual, privacy serves the contexts, and that what is what we mean by contextual values. We're doing some work on education, and it's really interesting to see how, depending on what you believe are the aims of education, you would have different views on what you believe should be the privacy constraints on the flow of information about students. Do you think it is about qualifying people for jobs? Do you think it's about um, creative learning? Do you think it's about producing autonomous um, uh, individuals uh, to become great citizens? Uh, do you think it's about the four R's or the three, three R's. Okay, you know what those are. So, so these are, these, if you want to bring us back to Rogaway, this is the sort of thing I think Rogaway is talking about when he uh, mention, mentions privacy as a public good. Um, and I, I love showing this particular slide. This is Andrew Mellon. Uh, 1925, he was the Secretary of the Treasury, and just look at the way he frames the argument for making tax returns confidential. So there was a turn, you know, some new privacy rules were set in place at the time that Andrew Mellon was the Secretary of the Treasury. He wasn't saying let's protect the individual, he was saying, hey, if you don't protect the individual, they're not going to say honestly what their earnings were. And then the treasury is going to lose out. That was the reasoning. And that's very much, I'm sure he would have supported contextual integrity had he been alive today. So this is the overview of contextual integrity. Here are the four claims, but if you want to capture the intuition, it's just the idea that certain parties may obtain certain types of information about other parties under the right terms and for the right reasons. So that's kind of the intuition there. Now, these, uh, there are a million things. I was just practicing my hand at doing these things, but, uh, you know, I'm not going to 
cause too much uh, at them. So you might say uh, the Census Bureau is not going to tell uh, the Department of Homeland Security who the illegal aliens are, but maybe the Department of Homeland Security is interested in the statistical information, and here is um, something that differential privacy can do for us. So there are various recipients, they're the subject. I, I wasn't able to add the dimension of the transmission principles, unfortunately, but I wanted to just sort of flip through a few things for you. This is smart meters and um, some of the problems we may have with that. Um, <clears throat> you know, this is a really interesting one uh, in the sense that you have patients to the healthcare provider. These are the, all the parties that are getting healthcare information, and potentially your employer might want medical information, and maybe the insurance company wants to provide it, but at the moment that is strictly forbidden. So you don't want that to happen, and people are very concerned about that particular thing, but there's a lot that's threatening uh, those particular uh, constraints on flow. Okay, I'm not going to, I want to get to the last slide. Uh, the one I wanted to show you, which sort of gets to the Rogaway concern, is that you have all these people interacting with Google. Google is a massive um, curator of data, um, and maybe we want differential privacy before it goes to Google in the first place. Axiom is another one of these parties. It's a, um, an enormous data broker that collects information from all sorts of places. Okay, so now this is my last slide. And I say now part one, because I'm done with the prequel and this is the part that I'm suggesting could be very fruitful discussion going forward. Let's go back to the Rogaway concerns and the question about information types. First of all, we have this problem with certain parties. Now, it all feels great when we're talking about the Census Bureau or we're talking about um, what are some of the other public health authorities uh, and the utility, if you will, that they can provide to researchers who would like uh, statistical information. But indeed, there are other parties who do hold a lot of information, such as, and that, you know, Google holds a lot of information about us, Facebook, Axiom, and other part, maybe uh, medical insurance companies. And maybe we're not so comfortable with those folks because we do have a somewhat, we data subjects have a somewhat adversarial relationship with those parties. And so to, to immediately claim them to be um, the trusted parties for any kind of privacy theory is to belie a certain kind of reality. So I think, um, you know, having spoken to various people about this concern, I'm, I learned that differential privacy, there, there's uh, a sense in which, uh, not a sense, but there is work which tries to um, create mechanisms that are differentially private going in. So the individual going in, the individual information going in to the Google data pool or the uh, axioms more difficult, maybe the Facebook data pool. But the problem with that scenario is, as I understand it, you would need Google to, the threat model would have to, you would still need Google to be willing to accept that kind of setup. You could not make that arrangement in an adversarial kind of relationship. And here is where I think policy and technology needs to work together. Because this is where policy, it need not insist that this relationship has to occur, but it needs to say that if parties want this relationship to occur, then the data holder must allow it to take place. So we need to look at these different threat models, accept that certain of the curators of enormous amounts of data um, need not be trusted parties, and then to see whether differential privacy 
can provide part of the story for us. Second of all, the right reasons. And I think Rogaway is just plain wrong on that one. Um, that's all I'll say. I think differential privacy is very keenly um, attuned to the fact that information has uh, pro-social uses and it's not only for the benefit, in fact, it's more for the, for the societal benefit. The third one, um, I'll explain my worry, and I could just be uh, wrong about this one, which is that it is true that we can learn about individuals, not because they're in the data set, but what we're learning from um, the research that's done on this uh, data set that is not just thrown open to the public, but allows for certain kinds of queries under mechanisms that are differentially private. Now, the reality of the world is that there's the auxiliary information. Many of the canonical examples that are given by people who speak about um, differential privacy are things that are clearly plainly visible, like does Cynthia smoke? And I have to get you back for this, Cynthia, but the last time you spoke about differential privacy, you talked about people with red shoes uh, being Donald Trump voters. And it so happened I was wearing red shoes that day. And so I felt very exposed. But <laughs> the truth of the matter is that the auxiliary information is held by those parties like Google, like the ISPs, like Facebook and so forth. And so the information that we kindly make available through mechanisms that are differentially private, say through the census, through the, whatever organizations we have. And actually, we could, I keep talking about Google, Facebook, but it's also the NSA. You, you know, take your favorite agency that uh, scares you and has a lot of information information, that's also auxiliary information, except only those people have that auxiliary information. And so there's a significant imbalance. We don't know what these people, these parties can discover about us. And um, this seems to be, um, I'm not sure that it's the responsibility of differential privacy to address this problem, but I'm simply saying that there can be a worry about what can be inferred from the uh, population information under these different kinds of conditions. Thank you very much. I look forward to discussion.